Hi, my name is Kevin Martin. Uh, I'm here with Andy Musa, and we are here to do the weekly update for the Lake Erie Regional Grape Program. This is our podcast for the week. I wanted to talk to Andy. Um, it, some of this is covered in his most recent newsletter article, but wanted to talk to Andy and get his perspective on the insects that are to come for the remainder of the growing season. It's mid-July right now, so we do have some time left before harvest, but uh, some of the insects that we target, we've already done that, uh, and there's a little bit more work to go, so he's going to talk about that. As Kevin said, I'm Andy Musum with uh, Penn State uh, Extension and also with the Lake Erie Regional Grape Program. Uh, yeah, today we wanted to talk about, uh, and, and this was in the, my article for July uh, for the Lake Erie Regional News article, and I want to talk about what to expect for the remainder of the 2020 season in the uh, Lake Erie region uh, concerning insects and diseases. Um, now, I want everybody to know that these are my expectations uh, based on uh, what the weather trend has been, especially since the um, uh, first week in July. And so they're based on that and also on what I've been finding in the vineyard up to this point. So, but you, I, I also want growers to remember that, uh, that each block is unique and different. So the pest situation is going to be different in each block. So it's frequent scouting in your vineyards is really going to provide you the most reliable information uh, for your pest management decisions. So keep those things in mind. Uh, first, I'm going to start off uh, with, say, the disease situation, what, what I think uh, is going to happen for the rest of the uh, season concerning diseases. Uh, as far as Phomopsis, uh, up to this point, I was finding... Uh, Oh, low to moderate levels of uh, shoot and leaf infections in vineyards. And as far as the rachises and pedicels go, uh, really finding low levels of infection. So considering that the majority of the Phomopsis uh, spores are depleted by about pea size berry stage, then I really don't expect uh, any problems as we get into harvest concerning um, Phomopsis. So I think as far as Phomopsis, we're uh, in pretty good shape. Uh, as far as downy mildew, again, at this point, uh, I really, the only, the only downy mildew I found was uh, one cluster in a wild grape uh, uh, next, to, next to a vineyard. Um, I know Brian Head had reported that uh, uh, he went out to look at a grower's Vidal vineyard, and uh, that was one vineyard that did actually um, have a problem, in a, and the grower put on a spray for downy. But other than that, even in the uh, Chamber Sin block at the uh, the research station at Penn State Northeast, he has not found any downy mildew at all in the uh, Chancellor block. And if anyone you know knows about Chancellor, they're like a magnet for downy mildew. So you expect it every year uh, in Chancellor blocks. And he said for the last few years, he hasn't found any downy mildew in those blocks. Have you ever seen it get started this late in Concord? Or is that, I mean, virtually unheard of? I really, Concords, I really, I really don't see it as a problem. Uh, first of all, Concords aren't that susceptible to downy mildew, uh, unless it's a especially uh, wet year early in the season. Uh, I usually don't worry about it in Concords. And the fact that our region really hasn't seen any problems with downy mildew, I would say in at least the last four or five years, then again, I don't expect downy mildew to be a problem at all in Concords. Now, I, I do want to mention that, you know, for Catawbas and Niagara's and other uh, sensitive, highly sensitive varieties of uh, French hybrids and viniferous, uh, you still have to be aware of, of the potential for downy mildew problems because if, if you know, it, it changes from this hotter, drier conditions, and especially as we get into the fall, you know, temperatures might cool off, and if we start to get more frequent rains, thunderstorms, then uh, downy mildew can be, you know, kick up. So you, you have to be aware of that. And, and if you have those types of varieties that are susceptible, then you, you have to be sure you're scouting your vineyards to, to pick that up before, you know, we do get into any problems. But uh, generally, like I said, Concords, I don't expect it. And get out there and scout your um, uh, other blocks that may be more susceptible. Uh, as far as black rot, Again, we're about oh, four weeks out of bloom right now. Uh, I think it was mid-June, I think, at the uh, 
uh, Claire Olab, they said, what, the 14th or 16th? Is I, think, when, I think the 14th, yeah. The 14th. So yeah. we're about four weeks uh, away from bloom, and Concord berries are susceptible uh, really for about five to six weeks after bloom to where the berries can still get infected. Uh, at about four weeks, they're highly susceptible. And then as the fifth and sixth weeks, they're still susceptible, but less so. So we got about two more weeks to where there's a potential for berry infections. Uh, but again, scouting vineyards uh, so far, I'm finding uh, black rot on some berries and, and uh, you know, some leaves, but it's scattered. So uh, except for one or two sites, uh, that have usually high pressure, uh, they're near the woods. Uh, in those sites, I have picked up uh, enough black rot so far that you know I would be concerned. So if you have uh, vineyards that maybe have a history of black rot, if um, you're, say, border rows that are shaded uh, next to the woods, or um, you know you have situation where you're seeing more than, you know, a scattering of symptoms on the leaves, then uh, those situations, I would still be, you know, uh, aware that you could still get infections, especially if we get these rain events uh, for the next two weeks. Other than that, I think, again, we're out of the woods for uh, black rot, in, you know, especially in Concord. Now, uh, powdery mildew is probably the disease that you know, if, if we have to worry about, that's going to be the one that there's more chances that there'll be uh, higher levels of powdery mildew than these other diseases. And the reason for that is that powdery mildew doesn't really need, after the initial inoculum, uh, early in the um, season, I think it's 50 degrees, if I'm correct, about 50 degrees and a tenth of an inch of rain for, for the initial inoculum to get going. Once mm -hmm. you have that primary inoculum out there, then essentially, at least in our region, every day can be an inf infection period. Uh, so, you know, that disease doesn't need that um, uh, water to, to um, keep going. Uh, it likes high humidity. It actually likes uh, cloudy, cloudy weather, maybe uh, more humid weather. So again, depending on the rest of the season, we'll see. So, so I can't predict really uh, how bad it's going to be. But again, so far um, on the leaves, uh, I've seen uh, just small amounts of it. But again, as the season goes on, it normally uh, progresses and it will again this season. But to what extent, I'm, I'm not sure. So the so the unusual weather conditions that might help you manage powdery would be, would they be hot and dry or cold and dry or either or? It would be, well, again, uh, I think Wayne has done some research where um, early in the season, if you get those cold nights and, and things like that, or, or, or cooler nights, that that will set it back. But, it, but at this point, um, it would be the hot, dry conditions that actually um, are detrimental to um, to powdery mildew, and that's, uh, he did uh, research on uh, the amount of UV light. Um, now, he did, you know, you do have to watch again if, if you have uh, border rows um, next to the woods where the areas are shaded. Um, he found that, you know, uh, comparing shaded uh, areas with uh, areas in full sunlight, that the ones in the full sunlight had a lot less um, powdery mildew. So, um, but, Growers should keep in mind that, you know, underneath that canopy, you know, you have shading also. Mm -hmm. So, and it's usually uh, more humid. So, you know, it's not like that weather is going to completely stop powdery mildew, but uh, generally in those hot, dry conditions, uh, it's, you have less of a chance for um, uh, more severe uh, powdery mildew outbreaks. Uh, and again, Wayne's research did show that that really with the powdery mildew, um, it, especially in Concord vineyards, uh, when we talk about high crop loads, uh, seasons that are um, cloudy and rainy, uh, that's when later in the season, in those 
those conditions, you would have to, uh, it would be more important to put these late season sprays on. Because again, the uh, cloudy, rainy conditions, high crop loads, those combinations um, are, are both negative for, for ripening your crop. So, so far we're not in those conditions. So again, if we continue along how we're going, uh, powdery mildew, at least in the Concords, probably shouldn't uh, be that big a deal. You know, we're also, we also um, uh, aren't expecting uh, really large crop loads. But, but the point uh, I want growers to remember also is you're not going to know what your crop load is unless you're out there crop estimating. So it's really important that growers get out there and crop estimate. And now we're about 30 days uh, past bloom. And this would be the time that uh, growers should be out there uh, doing their crop estimations in each of their blocks. Yeah, and I think unlike Phomopsis, you're certainly going to want to continue to monitor powdery mildew infections. Mm -hmm. uh, something like Phomopsis, it is what it is at this point. Um, a little bit of light scouting might help make you more informed for decisions you're making next year. But with powdery, you know, um, potentially you're definitely going to want that information for next year. But you could still, even, even if you don't have a huge crop, consider an application this year. I think you know, it's not going to affect bricks this year if your crop isn't very large, but, but it's still that long-term uh, inoculum level that is very difficult to manage in powdery because it's the one disease that we actually do have to invest a significant amount of money in to, to take care of. Uh, you, and, know. you know, you and I had talked uh, uh, quite a bit of different coffee pots, Kevin, and I always uh, defer to you for the economic uh, portion of this, but uh, really, if a grower puts on another uh, spray later in the season for powdery, I mean, uh, economically, it's not that big a cost, is it? Well, like we talked about this at the coffee pot, and I don't know if we ever came to a real conclusion. Um, certainly, once berries are immune, the best product is probably um, copper, and you're looking at anywhere from 4 to $20 an acre for a copper spray. Okay. The other inexpensive product would be Tebiconazole. That's $4. Uh, certainly not an ideal product for a late season spray when the reason you're doing it is to try to keep inoculum levels low because you see powdery. Uh, but those are basically the two inexpensive options when you're really just trying to deal with making sure your inoculum levels stay low for the next year. And again, that, that's a good point bringing up inoculum levels for next year because uh, that is going to turn, what you end up at the end of the season is going to depend on, you know, what you're gonna start again with uh, in the spring. So if your inoculum levels are high, then obviously the following spring, you're gonna be battling, uh, you know, high pressure from powdery. Whereas if, if you controlled as much as possible, uh, again, your levels are gonna be low and you're gonna start off with uh, low pressure. Yeah, I think if you have two ton to the acre this year and uh, your berries are clean and you just let leaf infections get out of control, um, I think that's a weird combination of management strategies, so it's probably just not likely to happen. But we'll pretend that that's what happens. It's probably going to cost you, you know, if you want to get things back to clean, uh, an inexpensive pre-bloom spray. You're going to put on two sprays for powdery next year if you want to do the right thing. Um, so you don't really save anything. You just change the timing of when you do something. Right, right. So as far as the disease situation, I think we're in pretty good shape. Uh, again, if it starts to really get wet, then, you know, uh, downy mildew and your susceptible varieties could be a problem. But again, I still don't expect it. Even if we got wet, uh, wet from here on in, really big problem with Concord. They're just not as susceptible. And we don't really have that much inoculum around to be concerned. And then the other thing is, again, the black rot, possibly, you know, unless again, you're finding, it, it's fairly easy to find and we get wet weather within the next two weeks. Uh, I would say across the belt, black rot is little concern. And then powdery, like we just got finished talking about is probably uh, the disease you got to watch out for the most um, uh, for the rest of the season. 
as far as the insects go. Let me. Uh, the big one for the insects uh, is going to be great berry moth, I think. Um, early on, the first week in July, you know, going out and scouting, there's a number of blocks where webbing was not hard to find. And the first week in July, I was even starting to pick up uh, the red discoloration we call stings from feeding injury by berry moth. So we we're already picking that up. And growers were also reporting uh, I know Jennifer got some reports. I did. Um, I don't know if you did or not, but uh, growers were also saying that they could find more webbing uh, than, you know, maybe some other years, or it wasn't hard to find in some of the vineyards. So with those indicators and with, again, the, the hot, dry trend so far, um, I'm expecting for the third generation coming up, which, which the uh, Burry Moth Degree Day model, say 1620, uh, very moth degree days. That would be the, the start of the um, when we want you to spray for uh, the third generation. Uh, I would say we're going to have uh, high pressure uh, for the third generation. And if, if, if we reach that, the model also says if, if we reach that 1620 before August 5th, then we're going to have continuous pressure from there all the way through harvest. So that's going to be an indicator that we may you know, we might have this fourth generation this season. So you say if, um, just looking at NUA, it looks like there are going to be some places that do not reach that threshold, but maybe there are going to be some other places that do. Um, yeah, um, again, that's why it, it's really important that growers uh, check and monitor the, the uh, degree day model in NUA in the station that's closest to their vineyard blocks. So, so keep on top of that. Um, it's a little bit too early still, I think, to, to predict if we're going to have that fourth generation, but it really looks like it. We're, we're collecting, I think, anywhere from 27 to 34 uh, barry moth degree days per day. And a lot of times it might be, uh, you know, we're in uh, maybe 23, 25, 27. So we're, we're on track for above number of degree days for berry moth per day. Uh, and that's been since the beginning of July. And it looks like this next week also, we're in the mid eighties to even up in the nineties. So um, it looks like we're on, on par to uh, have that fourth generation. So uh, just really keep track of the um, uh, NUA station and the berry moth degree day model. As far yeah, as if you look at like the Harbor Creek station and a couple of the other stations along Route 20, which is where the bulk of the acreage is, um, you're already over a thousand growing degree days. You're well on your way to 1600. Um, it is going to have to stay warm. You know, you're looking at averaging 30 growing degree days to hit that by August 5th. Um, right. You look on the escarpment and they're about 100, 150 behind. So if there's any sort of break in that pattern, you might escape uh, an extra generation in those areas. Right. But, right. but in terms of the, the bulk of the acreage and where the intensity of pressure is, the, the places that often have to target berry moth uh, because it's a consistent problem are probably gonna get that, at least some of that extra generation. And even if we don't with the population levels the way they are, and as you get towards the end of the season, you sort of start getting overlap um, in, in these generations, or at least egg laying. And it seems like um, whether we have a fourth generation or not, it seems that a lot of times we get in trouble uh, towards harvest because of the egg laying, I think, is, is more stretched out. And uh, that's, when, that's when growers, I think, can get caught. With the with the berry moth, so even if we don't have that fourth, like you said, and, and we'll have to keep up the hot weather, like you said, to get those thirty degree days uh, per day to probably reach that sixteen twenty before August fifth. Uh, but yeah. but the potential is is pretty good at this point. Uh, so just, growers should just be aware of that. Um, and the other thing mentioning that is since we are having such high pressure, I don't want growers to to forget about their low and intermediate risk sites. 
you know, don't just think, oh, this, this is just a, a problem with the high risk sites. Um, I know in the past uh, at, at other coffee pots uh, in previous seasons, we've had guys, you know, say, well, you know, I, I looked in my low risk or intermediate risk vineyards and, oh my gosh, I already have, you know, I have a lot of burying moth. So if you have high pressure like this, you, you've got to be out there also scouting your low and intermediate risk sites just to see if, if you have that 15% injury level, you know, for the third generation. So be aware of that. Uh, the, the last two insects I'm going to talk about is um, uh, grape leaf hopper and Japanese beetle. Now, Kevin, I know that um, last couple of years, you've mentioned to me that there's uh, uh, some sites in New York that seem to have, you know, for what reason or not, because sprays have been put on in those, those areas, but problems with the grape leaf hopper. Yeah, and the latest, sort of, I guess, sort of rumor was it was really getting out of hand in that Hanover area. And um, it seemed to sort of get taken care of as two things happened. Um, growers changed the materials that they were using to target because uh, they kind of gave up on the inexpensive bifenthrin type products. Very, very good. Um, regardless of how inexpensive they were trying to operate, it just, it became pretty clear, or at least the growers were convinced that, that they did basically nothing. So you, the decision was to either spray a material that worked or not spray at all rather than try the inexpensive materials. So that changed and people switched to everything. Um, it, it, Admire Pro makes sense to me um, because it's inexpensive, but some other growers were convinced that that wasn't enough. Uh, so some seven went on and has been going on periodically. Uh, Leverage 360 is another one that growers have been using, which, um, you know, I would try to avoid materials that cost 15, well, Leverage 360 now is a little more affordable, but at the time was $15 an acre. Uh, they were probably spending more than 20 on seven. And this is to kill leafhopper, um, but it did take care of the problem. The other thing that happened was abandoned acreage became less abandoned. Um, it's changed hands in the area and this has happened all over the belt. Uh, but specifically in Hanover, I think it related to leafhopper pressure, not some of your other problems. Um, so we've seen, I think, everybody benefit from um, really vineyards in poor care or abandonment coming back or being removed, mostly coming back, I would say. Um, but yeah, there, there are still some sprays going on this year. It hasn't been widespread, and I don't think anybody has put on multiple sprays yet. So that's what's really changed is... You're, you're looking at maybe one spray for leaf hopper, maybe less in that area. Uh, it sounded like there were some issues in other parts of the belt with leaf hopper this year. Nothing more ex extensive than that. One spray and you're done. So. And again, with leaf hoppers, um, again, scouting, at least in the vineyards that I've seen, there really hasn't been a lot of pressure yet, but it's still early. It's still early. And, um, I know that research uh, that uh, Tim Martinson had done in the past found that really your biggest um, chance of economic uh, losses due to grape leaf hopper are in hot, dry years like we have. High leaf hopper, leaf hopper populations um, in certain sites where they're going to be a heavy crop. So it doesn't look like, again, we're going to have that heavy crop load. But the combinations of the hot, dry, the heavy crop load, and high leaf, leaf hopper populations is when you'll, you'll actually, uh, they've seen where you'll get economic uh, uh, losses, or you could. Yeah. And the other thing we saw, and I think Tim might have observed it as well, is to really get those high populations um, that present a real risk, you start to see that population build up earlier in the year. So if you walk out today and you don't see any leafhopper at all, it's very unlikely that you're going to see huge populations in a time frame that matters. Um, the, the one caveat I will say is I have seen that happen where um, 
it's because they're coming in from a neighboring vineyard. So the high population is there. It's just not where you are because you just killed it. And when, when that material wears off, you can get a population build up pretty quickly if your neighbor has a consistent population. And, and as far as that goes, again, um, uh, some research by Tim Martinson. Uh, Tim did do a scouting procedure for leaf hoppers, and it's in that bulletin 138. It's mm -hmm. a risk assessment of berry moth and guidelines for each and great leaf hopper. Uh, in the newsletter, there is that URL in the July newsletter uh, to go to the, if you want to go to that paper. Uh, but in that paper, uh, an insecticide application is recommended if, if the third week in July, so that would be coming up, if you're, if you're out scouting, if you're getting five nymphs per leaf at that time, then you know that, that's enough that you should probably put on a spray. In the uh, end of August, if you're out there scouting again, it, it would be 10 nymphs per leaf. So there is at least some, um, some uh, economic uh, threshold levels to, to give you guidance on whether or not you should spray. But, but generally, uh, in the majority of acres across the, the belt, um, we generally do not uh, need uh, just like prophylactic sprays for, for uh, leafhopper. But again, that's why the scouting is important. That's why, like you said, so in the Hanover area, if they've had problems over the last few years, they should really be watching that. Yeah. And yeah. Then, you know, uh, maybe if I saw four instead of five, <laughs> you know, I might think about the material I was using if I was targeting another insect to uh, try right. to keep that population at bay, but not necessarily make a special application to take care of them. Right. Um, and I think that's what a lot of growers run into with insects and have run into with leafhopper. You get these special chemicals designed to target particular pests. And then all of a sudden, when you were spraying for an insect inadvertently every year, five years in a row, and it was never a problem, you then now go multiple years without ever spraying anything that targets them. So then you do run into some issues um, right. as right. our chemicals get specific. And that's why, like you said, I think usually we don't have problems across the belt because guys are treating for other insects, uh, maybe Japanese beetle or, or uh, you know, especially berry moth. So unless they're using, like you said, a, a really specific material only targeted for um, berry moth like intrepid, then that doesn't affect leafhopper. So yeah, you're, you're essentially putting nothing off for leafhopper. Uh, and then the finally Japanese beetle. Now, I don't know if you've seen, uh, two about two weeks ago, um, I started the seed of buildup, maybe even three, but but only a, a small number. I'm starting to see more um, on wild grapes, uh, starting to see more leaf skeletonizing. And Concord, so, so far, I haven't seen that big a buildup. I haven't been out this week, though. But I did get a call from a grower that said there were pretty high populations already um, feeding in his wine grape varieties. So again, I can't predict how the Japanese beetle population is going to be. But if you have uh, young vineyards, uh, especially if you have a young vineyard or you have um, uh, vines and grow tubes, or if you have a, a lot of the wine grape varieties, the thin leaf wine grape varieties are uh, a lot more susceptible. They, they really prefer those uh, than the Concord. And so you really have to watch um, those varieties. As far as concords, you know, they can cause a problem and uh, growers do get worried about them. They, they can skeletonize the leaves, but generally if you go in a concord vineyard, um, you find them in pockets or congregations in certain areas and then you'll, you'll go, uh, you know, at a different site in the vineyard and you won't find hardly any. So overall, I would say most mature concord vineyards really don't need a specific spray for berry moth. I mean, excuse me, for Japanese beetle. But, uh, you know, again, research has shown that, that, that mature Concord vineyards with, with large canopies, they can really take uh, quite a bit of leaf injury before, again, there's any um, uh, economic losses. So just keep that in mind. So, so things to keep in mind if you want to decide if, you, if you're going to put a spray on again, would be naturally how high the populations are. Um, if you have, say, uh, young vineyards, again, uh, uh, vines and grow tubes, or really susceptible wine grape varieties, um, 
consider those things. And again, also crop load. And since we're, we're going to have a lower crop load this year, you know, those are things to consider before you say, hey, um, I'm going to put an a insecticide on for Japanese beetle. Because a lot of times, I think most of the times, it looks a lot worse than it really is. Uh, it just looks bad. And so growers go out and put a spray on. But, but um, I don't necessarily think that uh, um, in most Concord vineyards every year, you're going to have to need a spray for Japanese beetle. And, and I would say that this year too. But the majority of vineyards are not going to need a, a specific spray for Japanese beetle. Yeah, I, I really think the biggest thing right now is to do your crop estimation. We're 30 days post bloom. Uh, if you get a good crop estimation that, that doesn't particularly make you very happy, the only thing you should have left to worry about if you've done a good job for the whole season is probably just going to be great berry moth. Yeah, that's, that's exactly. Um, yeah. Now, if you get surprised by, you know, spots that are 10 ton to the acre, you're going to have to manage that a whole lot differently. So, um, and, and again, if you don't know what your crop, you don't do your crop estimation, you know, it, it's a little late um, after the fact or late in August or whatever to say, hey, I better do something and, and bump up my spray program. So yeah. if, you, if you don't know what you have, and, and also, again, uh, as far as pest management goes, you know, if you, you can manage a vineyard that has, you know, three or four tons of the acre a lot differently than, you know, eight to 10 tons. So you might want to say, well, maybe I don't need to spray in this four ton of the acre vineyard, but I'm going to put an extra one or two on my 10 ton vineyard. So uh, that's why, like you said, it, it's good to do your crop estimations to really know what you have. Well, thanks for joining me, Andy. Um, I think we covered what we need to cover and the life of the extension educator is now to hop from one call to another. So that's what <laughs> we're both gonna do. I'll uh, see you in a minute or two. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, thanks, thanks for, thank you uh, everybody for joining us and we will see you next week.